This is uh, another video about how continuous functions behave on intervals. So the next thing I'm gonna tell you about is the location of roots theorem. Maybe I should say too, in the video before this is where um, I told you how um, continuous functions are bounded on closed intervals and then also about the max-min theorem, which says that a continuous function attains its maximum and minimum value on a closed interval. So the location of roots theorem is the next thing. Um, similar setup as we have, if I've got some closed bounded interval i, that's the interval from a to b with brackets on the end, meaning you include a and b in your interval. And if you've got f that's a continuous function whose domain is that interval i, um, if Either, either of these two things happen. So if f of a is less than zero is less than f of b, or if f of a is bigger than zero, which is bigger than f of b, then there should exist some point c between a and b such that f of c is equal to zero. And so kind of the idea of this theorem, and I'm just gonna do the proof for the case that f of, e, f of a is less than zero, uh, and then f of b is bigger than zero. But just the idea for this theorem in a picture, uh, what's it trying to say? If I've got that f of a is negative while f of b is positive, uh, then like I know that those two points right there should be on the graph of this function. And if this function is continuous, then I need to be able to connect these dots without lifting up my pencil. And if I do that, ta-da, I have to cross the x-axis somewhere. So that would be my root. So a continuous function, since I've got to connect those dots, I have to cross the x-axis. So this function has a root. And again, by root, I mean some value C in the interval between A and B such that F of C equals zero. So again, we're just gonna prove uh, this one here. This one would follow similarly. So what the idea is, is we're gonna construct a bunch of subintervals, a sequence of subintervals I by successively bisecting this interval from A to B. And this is actually called the bisection method. This is uh, one, uh, it's a computer algorithm, or I guess maybe, um, people have programmed this into an algorithm to solve you know, certain equations and uh, to give us a good approximation to some solutions to some equations. And uh, this is kind of neat though, because maybe you took calculus one and you remember like Newton's method, which used the derivative to help approximate solutions to equations. This is sort of a derivative free, another algorithm way to try to do that. And if you take like a numerical analysis class, you'll actually get to, get to use this method more and get to see how it works say with Python or like with Sage. Um, so anyway, let's get into it. So how are we going to construct these subintervals? So let's let I1 be the first subinterval, and let's just take I1 to be I, like the interval itself. And all I'm going to do is just relabel it. So A, I'm going to think of that, that, that's a highlighter though, hold on. A is just going to be relabeled as A1, just to kind of denote and emphasize it's in my first subinterval, I1. And I'm going to relabel B by B1, again, just to emphasize that B1 is like my first right endpoint. It's just B though, so this guy is just B1. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at P1, which is the midpoint of I1. So P1 would be what, like right here? And there are a few things that could happen. So by the way, P1 is A1 plus B1 over 2. So if F of P1 is 0, then we're done, right? P1's my root, my C that I'm looking for. P1's a great point between A and B that uh, is the root of the equation then. Otherwise, what can happen? So there's two things that could happen. F of P1 is positive, in which case what we're going to do is define the next subinterval. So the next subinterval, I'm going to take A2, the next left endpoint, to just be the same as the first left endpoint, A1. I'm going to take B2 now, the second right endpoint. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use P1 now as my next right endpoint. And then my interval is going to be this A2, B2. So to give you a picture here, if I fill this in, here's P1. What I'm saying is, if F of P1 is somewhere like up here, say, if it's positive, then my next subinterval is going to be this. So what I've highlighted is what I'm going to call I2. So A, A2 is the same thing as A in my picture, and now B2 is the same thing as P1. On the other hand, the other case or the other possibility is that f of p1 is less than zero, in which case we'll take p1 now to be my next left endpoint, which is what this says, and we'll take b2 to be uh, my next right endpoint. And so in other words, in my picture, here's p1 up here. If f of p1 is like down here, say, now I'm saying let this interval from p1 to b1 be the interval i2. And so uh, what do I notice then? What do I still have? So I2 would still just be A2 to B2. And uh, oh, I guess I was gonna draw you those pictures here. Anyway, I already did them though. But maybe just so, maybe in this picture one more time, let's say F of P1's down here. And now I'm saying that this interval here is I2. What I want you to notice is that I2 is contained in I1. So I hope that you guys see that. I highlighted up here just to emphasize, maybe I could just do a different color. 
So I2, that yellow, is inside the red. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep, keep on doing this. And oh, I skipped over one more thing. What do we still notice? I still notice that uh, in either case, let's say I'm still in this one, right? F of A2 is still negative, right? Still below the x-axis. Where I have F of B2, well in my picture it's the same one, which is still positive. And uh, that holds either way, whether one or two happen. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to continue defining these intervals. I can keep doing this. So I'm getting a whole bunch of I1, I2, and onward, where I just keep cutting them in half. And uh, depending on what happens is how I'll label the endpoints as, you know, if I'm at the kth step, say, who's AK and who's BK? And you know that one of them should be the midpoint, PK. Now there's two possibilities that can happen. First possibility is that there exists some natural number K where this process just ends. So how does this process end? Well, that means that f of pk, right, that midpoint of that kth interval, has to be your root. Otherwise, the other possibility, remember I said that there are two possibilities, um, the other possibility is maybe the sequence just continues on and on and on. So like, maybe it looks like none of these midpoints ever becomes the root. Well, in that case then, what do you have? You've got a sequence of nested intervals, right? So this sequence of intervals is nested because they're all contained inside of each other. And what else do I know? I know that they're all closed bounded intervals. They've all got brackets on them. And so uh, I1 contains I2, contains blah, 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 and it keeps going. So these intervals get smaller and smaller and smaller and are inside each other. But remember the nested intervals theorem back in two in section 2.5 of Bartle and Sherbert, if you have that book, by the nested intervals theorem, there should exist some number C that's in every single one of the intervals. It's in the intersection of all of them. So if I think about what's it mean to say that there's a number C that's in every one of these things, that means that for all natural numbers K, C is between AK and BK. So what if we look at, if since these intervals are shrinking in size, Remember, BK minus AK is the length of the subinterval, IK, and if they're shrinking in size, then that length is going to zero. So the limit of BK minus AK equals zero. And so now, if I think about what does this combined with this tell me about? Well, this tells me, if I use my limit laws, right, uh, that tells me that the limit of BK should be the same thing as the limit of AK. And now if I apply that here by the squeeze theorem, that limit should be C. So the limit of BK is the same as the limit of AK, and by the squeeze theorem, because up here, that limit has to be C. But what else do I know? I know that F's continuous, so I should be able to apply F to all of these inputs here, and this fact about limits should still hold. So what's another way to say that? The limit of F of BK should be the same as the limit of F of AK, which should just be F of C. But by construction, remember, all of these AKs were picked so that F of AK was less than zero uh, for all natural numbers K. So therefore, if F of C is the limit of the AKs, then I know that the limit can't be positive all of a sudden. It's got to be a non-positive number. So it's possible it could be zero but, or it could be negative. So I've got that f of c has to be less than or equal to zero. But now I'm gonna do is apply the same logic to f of bk. So how are these f of b, how was bk picked? Well, bk was picked in a way so that f of bk was always positive. So this sequence is always positive. So therefore the limit of the f of bk's should, you know, at worst be a non-negative number. And so if I think about both of these inequalities together, how is f of c less than or equal to zero? Simultaneously, f of c is bigger than or equal to zero. It must be the case that f of c equals zero. So by the nested intervals theorem, that point that that theorem guarantees you that you have has to be your root. And that's the end of the proof. So let me tell you about maybe how is this thing used. And so maybe you've got some kind of gross looking function, x times pi to the x minus three. I claim that it has a root in zero, one, right? I don't know what the heck it is, but I could justify to you that yes, the graph of this thing has to cross the x-axis somewhere between zero and one. And to do that, what we would do is maybe we hunt around in here for two convenient points and see if the sign changes. And so if I plug zero into that function, I get negative three, which is less than zero. But if I plug one into that function, I get pi minus three. Well, pi is a little bit bigger than three, therefore that's positive. So the fact that we change signs in there tells me, and since it's continuous, us, that tells me that there has to exist some point between 0 and 1 that actually makes this equal to 0. The last thing I want to tell you about is Bolzano's intermediate value theorem. So let i be any interval, so it doesn't have to be closed necessarily. 
could have parentheses, and let f be a function that's continuous on i. If you have two numbers a and b that are in i, and by the way, I'm not assuming that a is less than b, and so the way that I write the rest of the theorem is gonna be a little bit different than usual. So we're not assuming a is less than b, but they're just both members of this interval. And let's say k is any real number that satisfies the following. k is between f of a and f of b. Uh, then there should exist some number c in my interval that's between a and b, such that f of c is equal to k. And so to give you an, an idea of this picture here, so let's say that it happens that A is less than B, so I can draw this picture. And uh, what the theorem is trying to say is for any K that you pick here, I don't care where it is, maybe I'll plop it here, for any K that's between those two, if you've got a continuous function, that means that when I draw the graph, I have to connect the dots. Therefore, there's gotta be some point here, some C whose output is K, which is all that this is trying to say. And again, that's because you have to connect the dots from f of a to f of b to draw that graph. So that's kind of the picture of what the intermediate value theorem says. So how do we prove this thing? This will be a, a good technique that we'll use uh, a little bit later. So let's suppose, first of all, that maybe a is less than b. And so what we're going to do, here's the trick, here's the technique. I'm going to define this new function that is just f of x, the function I was given, but minus this number k, this fixed number k. And so what do I notice then? Well, when I plug in A, I get something that's negative, right? And uh, because that, so G of A would be F of A minus K, but F of A is less than K. Therefore, G of A is negative. But similarly, when I plug in B, when I plug B into this, that's F of B minus K, but F of B is bigger than K, so G of B is positive. So what have I got? I've got that this function G, it changes sign, and I know that by the location of roots theorem, it's got to have a root then, right? Since it changes sign between A and B, there's got to be some number C where it actually equals zero. So there's got to be some C between A and B where G of C equals zero. If you think about plugging in G of C equals zero to here, that says that zero, which would be this side, equals F of C minus K, which is that. And now just add that K over to the other side and you get K is F of C. Uh, the only other possibility you got to think about is, okay, that was if A is bigger, less than B. Now we'll look at what if A is bigger than B. Well, I'm going to similarly define a new function, and let's just make it K minus F of X. So that's H now. And again, notice when I plug B into H here, I would get K minus F of B. But wait a minute, F of B is bigger than K, so that means H of B has to be negative. And similarly, uh, when you plug A into H, that would be k minus f of a. Since k is bigger than f of a, that would be positive. So h of a, what did I want to circle? h of a is bigger than zero. So again, a location of roots theorem applied to h tells me that h has to have a root between a and b. And so that c would be my root. So there exists some c that is a root of h. But what's it mean to be a root of h? That says that zero has to be k minus f of c. So now add f of c to the other side, and you get that f of c is equal to k. So Bolzano's intermediate value theorem um, was kind of a consequence in some way of the location of roots theorem from before.